China is on a war footing. Unverified video on social media shows streets in Wuhan, where the virus originated, being sprayed with disinfectant. But questions linger over how China's government is dealing with this invisible enemy. But hospitals are swamped with an acute shortage of beds. Gymnasiums and sports stadiums have been turned into temporary medical... The official narrative put out on state media was that the government the had things under control. That was the only permitted narrative. The latest infections included a newborn baby. They're fighting a war here and they're losing. The death toll continues to climb across the Spain. Numbers of people are coming to the coronavirus. In the capital of the country, it's hospitals are reaching full capacity. In northern Italy. Here the halls and waiting rooms are packed, standing room only. The staff are working as they wait for someone to, to treat them. People from deteriorating. In another floor. Madrid hospital, patients lie on the floor because there are no dying. beds left. Two patients from the same family in England have tested positive for coronavirus. The first cases to be recorded in Britain. And in that context, when we're starting to hear some bizarre autarkic rhetoric, when barriers are going up, and when there is a risk that new diseases such as coronavirus will trigger a panic and a desire for, for market segregation that go beyond what is medically rational to the point of doing real and unnecessary economic damage, then at that moment, humanity needs some government somewhere that is willing at least to make the case powerfully for freedom of exchange. Some country ready to take off its Clark Kent spectacles and leap into the phone booth and emerge with its cloak flowing as the supercharged champion of the right of populations of the earth to buy and sell freely. Boris Johnson has a major responsibility for the way in which we mishandled the crisis from the beginning by giving people false reassurance. In this country, the number of infections and deaths was low, but epidemiologists knew and were telling him that with an exponential rise in uh, infections, uh, the death rate would also rise and we would quickly see this country going the way of Italy and possibly worse. The message coming out from government at that time was that for most people, this is a mild and self-limiting illness, rather than saying that for a proportion of people, this is a fatal illness. The government caused damage both to the health of the nation and the economy, but I'm not sure I would agree that they prioritised the economy over health. I think they prioritised political expediency. Right from the beginning, it looked uh, from everything they did as though they were using this or treating this as a political crisis rather than a health crisis. to allow large public gatherings at a time when epidemiologists were clearly saying that this would be risky was uh, what you might call public health negligence and led to a substantial number of avoidable deaths. It is not the case that at the time when we could have uh, put into place much more stringent social distancing measures to prevent the spread of the virus, that we didn't understand what the virus could do and what the infection rate was, and we knew how dangerous it could be. And so it would not be accurate, in my opinion, to say that the government didn't have the information. They took a view, and this is something that has been very um, prevalent in their thinking of what you might call um, uh, exceptionalism. That is to say, they saw what was happening in other parts of the world and they thought, well, it won't happen here, when all the evidence is that it would happen here. I know that millions of people in this country have been suffering. Thousands have died. Many are angry about what they've seen in the media about my actions. 
I did not ask the Prime Minister about this decision. He was ill himself and he had huge problems to deal with. Every day I have to exercise my judgment about things like this and decide what to discuss with him. On Sunday the 12th of April, 15 days after I'd first, after I first displayed symptoms, I decided to return to work. My wife was very worried, particularly given my eyesight had seemed to, seemed to have been affected by the disease. She did not want to risk a nearly 300 mile drive with our child, given how ill I had been. We agreed that we should go for a short drive to see if I could drive safely. We drove for roughly half an hour and ended up on the outskirts of Barnard Castle Town. The so-called Dominic Cummings affair was more damaging, not from his actions per se, but from the reaction of the government and government ministers following it. They were saying that as far as they were concerned, he had done nothing wrong and had nothing to apologise for when everyone else pretty much knew that he had and that at the very least he should apologise, but probably also have been sacked. So the key thing here was not so much what he did, but the way in which government and government ministers treated, in my opinion, the country like idiots. It clearly is going to decrease trust in government and the evidence is that it did. If it's a political drama, then the key priority is reputation management. And so what you see is government ministers lining up to say things which seem to me to be palpably untrue or making claims about world-beating apps and world-beating programs. But the incredible thing it, to me as a psychologist around the public's reaction to this is the extent to which the public are willing to forgive it. It's like you've been lied to again and again and again and the next time they tell you another lie you go okay well maybe this time it's true and it isn't. I myself really wanted the government to succeed. We all did. The government has squandered that trust and now the figures show that the levels of trust are substantially lower than they were at the beginning and they're really not at a level that would be high enough for people to be routinely doing something because the government tells them it's the right thing to do. So it doesn't matter what the government says in terms of saying, oh, you've got to do this because it's the right thing to do, it's the moral thing to do, do it for the community. Because people are looking at the government and saying, well, you don't do that, you haven't done that, so why should we? You've just got to own up to it. You've got to say, well, look, okay, we do make mistakes. We have made mistakes. And we're going to look at that and we're going to, we're going to look at it dispassionately. We're going to analyze our own behavior and we're going to try and do better next time. The second part of this is that the messaging from the government has been confusing and confused with one person saying one thing, another person saying another. So the government has to find a way of getting the messaging across and it's not hard, you know, other countries are doing it. If you look at Scotland, for example, and the approach that it's adopted, they've had a much, much better track record in getting people to understand what it is that they need to do uh, and why they need to do it. As we've learned more about how this virus works and the impact that it has, what we're seeing is that Although it may not kill so many younger people, people are being affected chronically long-term by it in larger numbers than we had thought. It's not like flu, where if you get over it, you're over it. Uh, people talk about this thing called long COVID, which is people who are suffering from quite debilitating, in some cases, symptoms for at least months. And we don't know how long those are gonna last for. And that may well be true you know, going into the future. So we have to understand that even though the death rate is substantially lower in younger people, there is still significant morbidity uh, associated with this virus, which may go on into the future. It's possible that part of it is a continued inflammatory response or 
immune response, which is sort of rumbling on and continuing to cause tissue damage, it's possible. Uh, but it, you, know, you can't rule out the possibility that there is still virus in the system somewhere, in the brain or in organs, that, um, that we haven't been able to get rid of. You know, there's a lot we don't know, uh, we have to find out, and when we do, you know, we'll be in a position to try and deal with it. Essentially, he has this tendency to believe that if you believe, you can make things happen, make bad things go away, and so on. This kind of optimism, if it's justified by evidence, is a positive thing because it gets people fired up and doing things energetically that can make a difference. But if it becomes a kind of Walter Mitty type delusion, then it's a very negative thing because it means you don't take the necessary precautions to prevent bad things happening and you ignore warning signs. And I think, in my opinion, that that's what's happened here. It should abide by and take notice of the science, um, but it may have other priorities. But what it does need to do is to make sure that its decision-making is transparent. And so when it is going against what the scientists would recommend on the basis of public health for whatever reasons that it decides, it needs to say that that's what it's doing and it needs to say why. And I think it is true, in my opinion, that this mantra of we followed the science was to set the scientists up as a scapegoat for the decision making that was going on. The government should follow a zero COVID strategy. There are a number of elements to it, but the basic vision is to you do everything you can to get the infection rates as low as you can possibly get them, somewhere in the region of one in new infection per million in the population. And then you have an efficient test, trace, isolate and support system in place to stamp out local outbreaks, which will occur, but you stamp them out very quickly until you can get a vaccine in place, which hopefully will mean that we can return to some kind of normality. The government has decided to uh, engage in what you might better call a drift and react strategy and the results are very clear both in terms of damage to the economy and also uh, lives lost. One of the things that I think uh, this pandemic has shown is that contrary to what the government's inclinations are, which is to centralise everything, that it is the local public health teams who actually know the local area and can do the best job when it comes to things like um, track, trace and isolate. So they're doing a much better job than the millions of pounds that are being spent on the centralised system. Where you have a community infection rate that's very, very low, then the impact of opening schools is also limited. But where it's higher, the impact of opening universities and schools um, is much greater. So in a way, schools and universities are acting like an amplifier for whatever infection rate is in the community. They will pass it on to older people. You know, it will spread in the community. It will take a while. So right now, we're seeing you know, a rise in infections, but we're not seeing a rise in hospitalizations. But I would expect that to change. I would expect that in time, a few weeks time, we will start to see an increase in hospitalizations and an increase in deaths. It seems almost inevitable to me that that will happen, unless there's something radically changed about the way this virus operates. Morale among NHS workers uh, has been low for some time, and in fact, it goes back um, to the last Labour government. This has been made worse by shortages of staff, uh, by underfunding, by the outsourcing of services, which has made, and I've seen this time and time again, communication 
within departments and across departments and between hospitals and so on, really difficult within the NHS. So their working conditions have deteriorated. They don't feel valued by uh, the government. And then you put on top of this the way that they've been treated in this COVID crisis. And I don't think it's an exaggeration. It's like putting your troops on the front line without a gun, without a helmet, without body armour, to face the onslaught of the enemy. And you just wouldn't do that. But the government did do it. And it did it knowingly, because when it comes, for example, to the PPE, the warning signs were already there before this epidemic started. My experience of healthcare workers and all the people, porters and others who work in the NHS, is that they really care about what they do, otherwise they wouldn't do it. It's not a, you don't do it because it's a well-paid job. That has sustained the NHS, and I think it will continue to sustain it. You know, but there comes a point where people just simply can't take it anymore. And you know, I fear for the NHS that we may be reaching that point.